I want to welcome everyone back to the Picanona show. We continue the series. Thomas, how are you doing today? I'm very well. Thank you, Pete. I want to continue today. I mean, it's a huge topic. And I mean, I realize that in this format, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to just go through some kind of encyclopedic reading of facts. And that wouldn't really accomplish what we're trying to, trying to get done anyway. You know, we're, among other things, in addition to presenting, you know, an accurate um, history of the conflict and of the Third Reich generally, you know, we, we, we want this to be a basically revisionist uh, exercise. And I mean, a lot of what, what that entails is, you know, kind of addressing the most common myths promulgated by court historians that sort of corrupt the conceptual picture people have of things. And so today, I, I think the way to proceed is to deal with Adolf Hitler and his role as warlord, quite literally, um, you know, and, and his strengths and weaknesses therein in that command role. Um, some of the challenges he faced, you know, both within the the control group of the Third Reich, you know, particularly his conflicts with, you know, military leadership and the general staff, you know, as well as the the political situation, which was, you know, in some ways more delicate than than people think, you know, and also, you know, deal with uh, the deal with, uh, you know, the misconception people have about about the war against the Soviet Union, both that it was this, you know, just kind of example of naked aggression. You know, I mean, we dealt, we dealt with that last episode, you know, and correcting the record on that in a large part. But also there's this idea is promulgated, in, including by some people who should know better, you know, people who have a, a background as general military officers. You know, this idea that um, the way the war was perpetuated or even, you know, deigning to launched the operation itself was was somehow this quixotic impossible mission that was doomed to failure that that it could not that is not the case at all and germany practically won the second world war in in autumn of 1941 and we're going to get into that and uh <clears throat> i want to get into some context first as to you know how um operational doctrine developed in uh in terms of the general, the German general staff's outlook, as well as that of Hitler himself, um, and it, some it, at times these viewpoints between the Führer and the general staff converged. At times they were very much at odds. But just to frame a uh, kind of the the core issues, and um, and I'm going to dive deeper into these as we go along. But just in order to frame what we're going to talk about this episode. June to July 1941, okay, the first weeks of Barbarossa, the Wehrmacht had, for all practical purposes, defeated the Soviet Union's field armies, okay, they utterly devastated the Soviet Union's military capability, to the point that it, it was a foregone conclusion in the minds of essentially everybody on both sides that the Soviet Union was defeated, okay, specifically, and of, or of specific significance to the revisionists, as well as anybody who just wants an accurate picture of about con combat resolved in the East. The, the period of August to October 1941 was absolutely critical. And the Third Reich could have not just vanquished the Soviet army, but they could have defeated the Soviet Union. Okay, why this didn't happen owes to a titanic error, or actually a couple. But uh, one in particular, we'll get into, uh, you know, a decision, uh, a decision uh, at, uh, at, at the level of... Uh, Supreme Operational Command that that sabotaged that possibility. Um, you know, it. Uh, the short answer is uh, that uh, Army Group Center, which was the Schwerpunkt of uh, the entire assault on the Soviet Union, on July 29th, uh, Adolf Hitler, for all practical purposes, halted Army Group Center's advance diverted it in an eccentric attack posture into Ukraine in order to annihilate reserve forces there that he feared could be utilized to outflank the Wehrmacht. And why? And this delayed the assault on Moscow for critical days, and uh, which allowed uh, the Red Army to reconstitute, you know, allowed, permitted uh, the weather to become totally unfavorable to, to mechanized forces. And, uh, and essentially halted the assault at the gates of Moscow, okay? And this is something that's 
that's deliberately overlooked. Um, and even people who don't have a, a particularly charitable view of the Wehrmacht, uh, again, within six months, the Wehrmacht was literally at the gates of Moscow. So that alone should kind of raise suspicions that, you know, court history and its description of, of this of this of this massive operation as some again some crazy quixotic effort that was doomed to failure i mean that that should smash that misconception to pieces and finally um we got to get into uh the what i think was the myth of blitzkrieg okay blitzkrieg does describe something but it's not there's not some school of warfare called blitzkrieg okay um basically what it describes is it describes a break with precedent owing to uh owing to a, a, a dramatic innovations in mobility and specifically, you know, the ability of uh, the ability of assaulting armies to gain advantage in ways that theretofore was not possible. OK, um, now, why what what was Blitzkrieg diverting from in terms of its precedent? Interestingly, and this shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. The uh, really the uh, the primary German contribution in political terms to what you know in kind of you know linear history, mainstream history is called the Enlightenment. The primary contribution in in in, in pure political terms as a body of theory was Clausewitz. Okay, and Clausewitz was a theory of war was a theorist of warfare. Now, Clausewitz declared you know. A lot of things, um, both about the nature of poli the politics of warfare, and he considered politics and military activity to be basically synonymous. And that is significant, and it's all you know, not just generally, but it's significant to how how Hitler approached military problems. It, it didn't owe to just eccentricities of of within the mind of Hitler himself, and 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 features of his own personality. But Clausewitz also in 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 strategic terms and how he described, you know, the, the battle space, the modern battle space. Um, he declared in no uncertain terms that there's no shortcut to victory. Like what he meant was that, you know, okay, there's going to be technological innovation, you know, there's going to be adaptations to, you know, changing conditions owing to these innovations, but that basically in the Clausewitz view, you know, the only way that, you know, what wins wars is, you know, victory and set peace battles. You know, that emphasize, you know, where victors emphasize the advance of fire, you know, and when possible, substituting firepower for manpower to mitigate, you know, attrition. Um, and through this process, you know, just, you know, kind of a gradual weakening, weakening of the defender and subsequently exploiting, you know, holes that are punched quite literally in the main line of resistance, you know, uh, basically killing enemy armies through, you know, this process of, you know, brutal application of firepower in terms most likely to create um, opportunities to, to to breach resistance lines, okay? Um, patterns of deployment, he believed, were constant. Again, you know, the only thing that changes is the ability to apply, to apply fire um, in terms of, uh, you know, the its destructive force as well as its, you know, as well as its targeted accuracy. But, uh, you know, the Clausewitzian mantra is that firepower saves lives. The strength of an army, you know, is, is estimated in multiplying the mass by velocity, which was also a Napoleon uh, uh, axiom, a Napoleonic axiom, rather. Now, this basically characterized combat until 1918. Um, what happened was the advance of armor, uh, which, you know, arrived on the battlefield in the Great War, but hadn't really been utilized to deliberate effect other than as a kind of, you know, way of, uh, other than as a kind of mobile firepower. What changed uh, in the inner war years uh, was that people like Von Sieg to, uh, was somewhat, people like Rommel uh, for context and Von Manstein were the theories of von Sieg and von Sieg, he didn't have a, he, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't have opportunity to view the concrete particulars of armored combat, but he had a sense of how it would resolve. How armored combat did resolve the, the textbook example is the Battle of France, okay, and 
what happened there was that armored columns were able to strike so deeply through French lines that essentially, even where uh, even where the French were deployed in depth, they were constantly having to regroup and try to reestablish the main line of resistance. They were unable to do that because they kept on getting smashed and they literally could not keep up with the advancing panzers. And when they could, they'd find themselves often in reverse lines. So this caused like utter chaos. And on top of that, um, because the armored columns overshot the infantry, which at that point was still on foot, you know, mechanized infantry didn't exist yet as we know it. As they were trying to reconstruct the mainline resistance, they'd get hit by supporting infantry, which would smash them again. So basically it's, you know, the coup de grace was, you know, Wehrmacht infantry after this kind of devastating punishing blow, okay? Now, this is just kind of how battle developed, okay? If you've got a dedicated armored uh, element in your uh, in your ground forces, it's not like somebody sat down, you know, whether it's not like Erwin Rommel or Yodel or uh, or um, von Manstein sat down and said, okay, I have a theory of warfare, it's called Blitzkrieg, and, like, this is what it entails, and, you know, this is its doctrinal uh, features. It's nothing like that. And um, on top of that, the German army, despite the myth that uh, there's this really, really idiotic myth that's promulgated by people who are, I, they've got to be conceptually illiterate or they, or they just aren't interested in, in presenting a true and accurate uh, picture of uh, the Wehrmacht and, 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 and kind of the German way of war. Um, Germans practice what's called mission-oriented tactics. Okay, general orders are issued um, all the way down to the company level, and commanders are given broad leeway in how to accomplish those objectives. Okay, it's it's really kind of the opposite of how the Russian army today and previously the Soviet army does things, where uncertainty is attempts at eradicating uncertainty is a uh, there's an attempt to eradicate uncertainty by 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 treating doctrine uh, almost like regulation, you know, and giving commanders very, very little leeway. That's changing, but that's outside the scope of what we're talking about. But so what I'm getting is that you have these German armored commanders and they're smashing through the main line of resistance at rapid pace. And uh, they're not being told to stop. They're being told basically to chase the enemy down and kill him. And that's what they're doing. And before they know it, they find themselves, you know, traversing 300 miles, like beyond, you know, the initial objective. You know, and uh, and uh, and and chasing um, chasing enemy armies, you know, deep, deep into 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 territory beyond the initial objective. You know, and their uh, their flanks are secure because they quite literally outran every supporting element of uh, the opposing force. And even if they weren't, you know, again, like they're backed up by this infantry that's you know, uh, going to arrive fresh and smash whatever. Uh, whatever forces might be trying to uh, trying to perform an encirclement maneuver, um, which by that point wouldn't matter anyway a lot of time because, again, you know, they'd be dealing with reversed uh, lines, which caused all kinds of havoc in those days, particularly before, you know, what we consider to be, you know, with the kind of command and control we did for granted was present. So... <clears throat> So there's not there's not, there's not a school of battle called Blitzkrieg where what it is is it's describing what it described in the moment was you know how combat was resolving in ways that theretofore like had not been experienced because the technology was not available for any such thing like that to you know to uh to be decisive on the battlefield. So as the uh as the general staff and as Hitler observed this, uh, that changed the way they approached strategic problems. And they came to realize, as did Hitler himself, that uh, the Soviet Union, unlike the Western Front in World War I, which created bottlenecks, was this vast step. Okay, it's basically, you could not ask for a better uh, or a more ideal uh a more ideal kind of terrain to, to wage armored warfare, you know, particularly if you have a, particularly if you have a certain advantages, which in, in large part the Germans did. So that's important um, because it owes the conceptual uh, mindset of, uh, of, of Hitler himself and, and the general staff on, um, on the eve of battle. So, this kind of brings us to 
an overarching matter in revisionism, this idea that Hitler was this reckless gambler um, in military and political terms, and that you know he some you know he 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 was emboldened by these successes that he had early on, and he pursued this kind of Quixotic, uh, crazy, uh, you know, he unleashed this, this 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 irrational kind of war on the on the on, on the Soviet Union that was devoid of strategic logic. That's totally at odds with precedent, in my opinion. Um, we talked in the last episode about. Um, Hitler holding back forces from the Rhineland in 1936 rather than risking war with the UK and France. I mean, that that was characteristic of Hitler. Um, Hitler didn't assault Czechoslovakia, despite uh, the kind of myth of Munich and, this, uh, and, and the fact that it's kind of become synonymous with, you know, Nazi aggression. Hitler very adeptly was able to... Uh, you know, discredit not just Benes, but the entire enterprise of the Czechoslovakian regime, you know, and uh, by the time, uh, by the time uh, it, it would have been uh, opportune to give an assault order, you know, Slovakia had already seceded, the Sudeten Germans for all practical purposes had, you know, had become an independent uh, protectorate. Um, you know, the Polish and uh, Ruthenian minorities were demanding their own independence. Like Czechoslovakia had ceased to exist owing to Hitler's, you know, intrigues. OK, if Hitler was just this gambler who, you know, favored, uh, favored, uh, favored the gun proverbially over, you know, over, um, over uh, the conspiratorial uh, option. I mean, that, that this this would not have happened. When Hitler finally did give an out and out assault order, it was against Poland, and that was only after the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact had been put to paper. Okay. And essentially by that by by doing so and by securing the, the cooperation of the Soviet Union, at least for that limited purpose, there was no chance that Germany would get uh you know forced into a war with the Soviet Union before they prepare before they were prepared. But that also meant there was no chance that you know, the UK and France would be able to deploy in theater, you know, and, 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 and turn the tide of, uh, turn the tide of, of war. So essentially Hitler, not only was he not, you know, a reckless gambler on strategic questions, he waited until quite literally the fix was in, um, before, uh, pulling the proverbial trigger. And based on those instincts, you know, militarily cautious, but politically bold, I mean, what did by July 19, by July 1940, what had Hitler done? He defeated Poland, Denmark, Norway, Luxembourg, Holland, Belgium, and France. He occupied virtually all those states and defeated the British Army. I mean, can't, like that, that, a gambler doesn't win 100 percent of the time. Okay, like you can't. That's ridiculous. It uh, and uh, it was in July 1940. That's when Hitler decided that uh, the Germans were going to preemptively assault the USSR. Um, I know people are going to take exception to that in the comments and probably other places. Like, what do you mean preemptively? Okay, we dealt with that last episode. I'm happy to argue the point with anybody, uh, you know, who wants to take it up, but I, I'm not going to reiterate everything we covered because that's not fair to the listeners. And I, I worry I'm going senile and repeating myself already. I don't need to do it on purpose, but... Um, Hitler's decision to assault the USSR in 1940, that was really the only way that Germany wins the Second World War. Okay, in strategic terms, it was the correct decision. You know, I'm not saying in moral terms, I, it, it, uh, I'm not going to weigh in on that. I'm not, I, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying, uh, I'm not coming out swinging in, in, in defense of, of, of the Third Reich's political ambitions or, or making some kind of chauvinistic point about Germany. I'm speaking in realist strategic terms. It was the right decision. Um, had Germany vanquished the Soviet Union, any posture the British took, um, even if they still had the empire intact, it would be meaningless. Okay, Germany would have had control of the entire continent from the Atlantic to the Urals. They would have had all the fuel, all the iron ore, all the agricultural resources of the entire continent and part of Central Asia. Okay, I mean... Even in the even the best of all possible worlds, under that under those circumstances, uh, even if Britain was was to marshal all of its resources available from the empire, which again are presuming to be totally intact, 
they would have been a fundamental disadvantage, you know, a, against Germany. And in North Africa, it, you know, it Germany could have bided its time and and in, uh, in defeating them piecemeal, or they could have staged simply a mass invasion, you know, with the assistance of Italy. And they would have had, you know, they could have uh, they could have knocked the U the Royal Navy out of the Mediterranean, um, with really without with, with you know with, without having to worry about you know sacrificing resources that were needed in, in any secondary theater. Okay, I mean, you would have been looking at a situation where Germany, again, with the resources of an entire continent, could have they mobilized and devoted all of its capabilities to total war against the UK. Okay. Um, not just that, but the reason I raised Nolte last episode is because there is a strongly political dimension to the Second World War. I mean, not just the obvious, but this was an epochal uh, moment, okay? Um, had the Soviet Union been annihilated, you know, not only would that have, have, you know, destroyed for all practical purposes the international communist movement, it would have put the nail in the coffin of this, you know, kind of New Deal democracy ideology, like all these things we take for granted as the as the kind of conceits of the victors and their their political values and you know the way they structure the world you know ethically these things would not exist you know any more than you know monarchy would exist or any more than you know any other kind of any other kind of vanquished ideology would would have a uh, you know animating power to you know to mobilize other people or or uh, or or determine the you know the the configuration of states and that war at peace or anything like that so that they can't be overemphasized. Like the Third Reich wins the Second World War if the Soviet Union is defeated. You know, the alternative is, you know, the Third Reich remains a second-rate power, you know, on a European continent that itself is kind of failing. And, you know, it, it becomes a it becomes either a client state of the Soviet Union because, you know, the, the USSR completes its full mobilization potential, which, uh, again, was rivaled by no state other than the United States. And it, you know, either just conquers Germany, you know, by force of arms, or it, it just, you know, absorb kind of becomes the pivot of the continent politically because it's so much more powerful than its next strongest neighbor that, you know, there's just no, there, there's no way that it can be resisted by, by, by force of moral will or arms or, or any other way. So it's, it's, it's asinine when people act like, you know, the Germans should have just kind of sat on their hands and done nothing. I mean, it, it, it indicates a lack of understanding of power politics, but also specifically the strategic situation of, um, of uh of 1940 41 um it uh it uh and that brings us to <coughs> the kind of common uh the kind of common uh refrain of court historians is that uh Hitler assaulted the USSR owing to the you know some kind of harebrained scheme to defeat Britain because you know that would have precluded not just you know the the you know the 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 burning in Germany of having to fight a two front war, but also it you know would have sapped uh, it would have sapped Churchill's regime of any of any confidence that you know they 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 could have had the benefit of of, of Soviet arms and and resources in order to perpetuate their own war. Like that's nonsense too. Again, the. Hitler did not want to conquer the United Kingdom. There was nothing to be gained from that. I don't think it was possible um, in operational terms because the forces in being weren't there. And even if, even if they were, uh, Germany did not have a deep water Navy that could have accomplished that. So it's just, it's it's a non, I wanted to preempt that before anybody raised that in the comments or something. It's a, it's a non-issue. But um, so on July 21st, uh, that's when Hitler gave the order to von Brauschitz to begin drafting preparation for Operation Barbarossa. You know, again, it was immediately after the defeat of France. It was after, you know, what in hindsight and in the epoch as it was, as it developed was viewed as blitzkrieg. It was this game changing sort of, uh, sort of, uh, development, you know, uh, the advent of armor on the modern battlefield, you know, and that um, that is what emboldened not just Hitler, but the general staff to pursue the assault then, in addition to the fact that, again, as we got into last episode, 
you know, the it 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 was critical that you know the Germans preempt what amounted to a, um, a massive Soviet mobilization that was underway. The purpose of which uh, the evidence is clear was you know to assault and conquer Europe and uh, with Germany as the kind of jewel in that um, geostrategic. <clears throat> prize and I want to make uh I want to make point I wanted to make the point too and this is not just a matter of semantics or something being lost in translation um Hitler's incessant return uh to the concept of Lebensraum like literally living space you, you've got to understand that in context you've got to understand that that term is utilized because of the polemical weight that it carries Hitler was not suggesting that Germany's overcrowded or something, or that, it, you know, it, it's got this burgeoning population like China or something. What he was saying was a, a, a more correct term probably would have been gross rom. But again, Hitler had a flair for the dramatic and he was utilizing polemic. Germany had to become a superpower. Otherwise, its political ambitions, its existential destiny, its survival in their own view uh, would, would, would have been compromised. Okay. You, you win the Second World War by becoming a superpower, okay? That is how you win. You know, you don't win it just by surviving or by hanging on by a thread or by becoming some client state of the Soviet Union. Um, and people who don't understand this only have to look at the look at the political map of the planet today, you know, and ask themselves, you know, why, uh, why uh, globally we're in this mess that we are with this, uh, with this, uh, with this American regime that, you know, um, although it's losing this ability, you know, as, as, as the capacity to project power anywhere in the world and, and slate, you know, other societies for annihilation that it, you know, does not view as sufficiently compliant with its ideological regime, with its ideological ambitions. Okay. I mean, it's, we're not talking about something academic here. We're talking about what happened. You know, the, uh, Europe was annihilated. Japan was annihilated. Um, United States and the Soviet Union divided up the world. You know, the Soviet Union capitulated uh, owing to, uh, you know, the burdens of the strategic challenge um, in the uh, later nuclear age. And you were left with a, with a, with a unipolar uh, uh, political, military, ideological regime. So that this is not academic. You know, I don't see how people can argue otherwise. But this brings us kind of the next big point Germany did not underestimate the Soviet Union, okay? Um, the Kaiserreich had fought for four years against the Russian Empire, just as they did on the Western Front. There was a huge percentage of German general officers who had fought the Russian army, okay? They uh, they knew the Russian character. They knew that the Russian people were very game, were very tough. They knew that fighting in Russia was an incredibly arduous and brutal experience. They, nobody, this was not some remote thing, okay? And these were not, this was not some, uh, this was not some second rate army, you know, that uh, that had no experience of of, uh, of, of the enemy and, and the terrain that they were planning to wage war on, you know? So that's Franz Halder. He was the chief of the general staff of the here. And Halder's an interesting guy for a lot of reasons. And he, he I mean, this man alone could, dedic would, could warrant a dedicated podcast or episode. But we're not getting into the kind of various intrigues of Halder. But what we, what we what is important about his character is that he was kind of the consummate reserved, you know, German officer of the year, okay? He was not particularly ideologically inclined. He was kind of calculating. He was not a man who had much in common with Hitler. but. Uh, he wrote in his diary, he kept a war diary, which is incredible because, I mean, it's like a historical treasure trove of testimony about what was in the minds of the general staff. <clears throat> he kept a diary dedicated exclusively to preparation for Operation Barbarossa from July 1940 when Hitler gave the order of preparation until June 22nd, 41, when the assault commenced. Um, and he wrote, he wrote about the coming operation with confidence but discernible trepidation. Okay, there's not a single remark in there that indicates he'd, un, you know, he was underestimating the Soviets or the rigors or the brutality or the severity of the coming war in the East. Like, quite the contrary. But uh, nonetheless, he had absolute confidence um, that combat would resolve 
in the so against the Soviet Union within six to ten weeks. Okay. On July 3rd, 41, Heller stated in his diary, and let me call it up here. Quote, after two weeks of war, the Soviets have been beaten. Okay. Now, why did Heller say that? It's, uh, there was a, I mean, it's hard to drive home the, the kind of devastation that the Wehrmacht was able to wreak upon the Red Army. Part of this was because in some of the theaters they were fighting in, I mean, this this was a massive front, you know, divided into three army groups. Army Group North was assaulted through the Baltics. The uh, Despite this kind of myth that the Germans were just, you know, acting like Genghis Khan and brutalizing the indigenous people everywhere they went, that's not true at all. The Germans had a huge number of allies among people conquered by the Soviets. You know, thousands upon thousands of these men joined the Waffen SS, and nor was the sympathy more kind of sharp than in the Baltics. And uh, Army Group North, as it kind of smashed through the Baltics and route to its uh, objective of Leningrad, you know, the people in the Baltic states, you know, they rose up against the Red Army. You know, so the Red Army was fighting not just the Wehrmacht, it was fighting, you know, people in places like Belarus, people in the Baltic states, people in Ukraine, you know, who had risen up against their communist overlords, okay? Like, a lot of what people claim about what was happening in the Eastern Front in the early days was totally at odds with what actually happened. Um, the uh, the German, uh, in terms of in terms of aircraft, uh, the exchange attrition rate was something insane, like, you know, 1 to 131 favoring the Germans. You know, they, uh, you know, you're talking about uh, armored columns striking literally hundreds of miles deep behind the main line of resistance, you know, within days. You know, this was unprecedented. Um, so what exactly happened um, to change this momentum? We'll get to that in a minute. But I want to, I want to reemphasize too. You know, we talked uh, last episode about the uh, on the eve of Barbarossa, the intelligence estimates and figures of Soviet deployment. Um, you know that were presented to Hitler himself by you know, uh, the, the uh, the high command of the army of the navy and of the Luftwaffe. Um, okay, these numbers were accurate. You know, I mean, it was, they were verified after the cessation of hostilities. You know, Hitler was, Hitler, Halder, the OKW, um, commanders in the field, you know, subordinate to that uh, executive structure, they were proceeding based upon accurate numbers. I mean, so it's, you know, you've got, you've got a Halder who's, you know, optimistic, but, you know, uh, exhibiting a lot of trepidation in his own personal writings. You know, you've got Hitler and the OKW who are planning this operation with remarkably accurate numbers, which is a credit to German military intel. Uh, the uh, the Abwehr was a disaster for all kinds of reasons, but and um, uh, raw military intelligence that came from the here and came from the Kriegsmarine and the Luftwaffe was actually quite, it, it's quite incredible that they were able to render such a, such a, you know, a, a factual picture of reality and, in, in, you know, with the technology that they, um, that's difficult even today with, you know, kind of the panoptic uh, vision that we have. But in those days, it was truly extraordinary. So, I mean, in material terms, uh, the Germans were at all levels were calculating victory odds based on actual forces and being. Um, and finally, and this is a huge point, and I, the only person I've ever heard refer to this was uh, Leon de Grel in any detail. I was like, okay, if the Germans underestimate, you know, underestimated the Soviet Union, why did it take 195 weeks for the Soviet Union to defeat Germany with the, with the, you know, with like lavish assistance from the United States, with terror bombing day and night by the United States and the Royal Air Force? with a massive invasion of Western Europe by the United States and the UK. Like, that doesn't sound like an underestimation at all, okay? If the Soviet Union was a juggernaut, um, I mean, should it have turned the tide of marching on Berlin within 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 weeks or months? I mean, like, think about that. It's it's not it's not a polemical point or a middling point. Um, it, uh, it, it, 
you know, it should have, uh, if there was, if there was parity between the, the Wehrmacht and between the Red Army and the defeat uh, levied against the Reich was this result of gross underestimation or hubris. I mean, we just established that, you know, modern warfare with, uh, with armor as the, as the kind of, as the primary uh, variable in ground combat. I mean, the Soviet Union should have, they should have, they should have turned the tide and, you know, smashed, smashed the German army within weeks, you know, as basically the Germans had done to them. Like once they reconstituted, obviously, but so why did this happen? We're going to return to, we're going to return to Clausewitz for a moment. Hitler basically was a siege commander. Okay. You know, emboldened as Hitler was by Blitzkrieg as much as, you know, this kind of figured into his calculus for what the correct strategic decision was. Hitler was a man who was born in the 19th century. You know, Hitler was a guy who fought on the Western Front, you know, uh, when warfare essentially, I mean, it, the, the, the body count was 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 horrendous, owing to the machine gun and owing to some other innovations. But, you know, World War I combat was basically on Napoleonic era combat, you know, set piece battles that resolved essentially according to like Clausewitz's dictum, almost, you know, to a T. You know, you can't escape uh, these formative experiences and how they inform your conceptual horizon. That's the way Hitler thought of things, okay? Um, at uh, where the rubber meets the road in terms of operational execution. Hitler was also a political leader, okay? And I mean, I there's this, you know, there's this kind of court history claim, like, well, Hitler was constantly interfering with his generals, his generals, you know, the, the generals know better. You've got a serious problem if you're a civilian chief executive and you're simply handing policy to your generals. I mean, that's called a military junta. Okay. I mean, even kind of one of the tragedies of a uh, of a uh, of any man uh, of any civilian executive at war, <coughs> whether you're talking about Mr. Putin and the president, whether you're talking about Adolf Hitler, you know, in 1941. Whether you're talking about John F. Kennedy trying to stare down Mr. LeMay and the Joint Chiefs during the Cuban Missile Crisis, there's always a, a critical tension between the armed forces and civilian leadership. And uh, this uh, this uh, th this has a, this corrodes operational effectiveness because there are times when a civilian leader needs to put the brakes on military decisionism simply to salvage his own political mandate and prevent himself from being bulldozed even if that harms the rapid execution of orders in the field. And that's a military sociology question, but it's, um, it bears out in all times and all epochs. And uh, Hitler was very much a civilian. Okay. Um, his role as warlord is kind of his critical contribution to history, but, you know, Hitler was not some career military officer, or a Prussian general. You know, he was uh, he served with this, with distinction as an NCO, but that was the extent of his of his uh, of his military life. You know, and that uh, the uh, that that's fundamentally important in understanding why he, he made the decisions he did at critical junctures. And finally, you know, in the. Uh, one of the reasons, and I, I'm going to bring this back, but this is an important point, okay? We were talking about a blitzkrieg. It more reflects a way that combat develops through uh, the application of technology and the technology of violence. That's really characteristic of the 20th century, and there's a parallel in strategic nuclear war planning where things got to the point that command and control structures to sustain the capacity to wage nuclear war were so complicated and so insinuated into uh into oblique features of of the national state civilian and military that that actually makes you more vulnerable than in more uh in more primitive phases of development historically one of the reasons blitzkrieg or what's perceived as blitzkrieg wreaks such havoc is that if you do penetrate deep behind enemy lines, you can wreak utter devastation on his logistics, on his command and control. You're literally traveling faster than information, okay, than is now. Although now, like, I mean, it, you know, in, in true strategic planning during the Cold War, that the uh, the uh, the window of decision was reduced to minutes, to reduce to minutes, but... You know, think about a man, Adolf Hitler was born in 1889. 
You know, I mean, the fact that he he didn't he hadn't fully adapted to the new way of warfare, I I think that I think that describes every chief of state of a combatant nation in the war. You know, I mean, I don't I don't think uh, I don't I don't I I I think that that neither puts you know any kind of shine on Hitler in in his command aptitude, nor nor is it some kind of gross sort of uh, strike against him. It, uh, but what is significant is that any man who's a student of Clausewitz and basically every German executive of the modern era, including Hitler's hero, Frederick II, you know, who was kind of the consummate dynamic Prussian officer, you know, of that type, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the ethos was, you know, to rapidly capture objectives, but to reduce, to limit those objectives to what, uh, to what can be, uh, effectively managed, um, and defended. Um, and what's telling is that Hitler paced Operation Barbarossa very deliberately towards the objective of capturing and seizing Leningrad, you know, and the capture of Leningrad in the opening days and weeks in his estimation, would allow a siege line to be created wherein German command and control would be in the most advantageous position available for an eventual assault at Moscow. Like, meanwhile, the Soviet Baltic fleet could be dealt with and knocked out. Um, what happened as Army Group North proceeded to Moscow, or to proceeded to Leningrad, is uh, Hitler ordered elements of Army Group Army Group Center to be diverted to back up Army Group North because his idea was that like well you know resistance is gonna is gonna be too great to be rapidly overcome and you know we've got to create our main line of resistance you know backed up by forces enough that you know if we get bogged down we can deploy in depth you know and establish you know a defensive perimeter you know this totally cuts a- against this kind of picture of Hitler as like reckless warlord who. Uh, you know, who, 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 who pulls the trigger before uh, loading the proverbial gun. Um, and eventually what happened is as army group uh, center did move on uh, Moscow, Hitler ordered to stop in its tracks. He ordered critical elements that were the mo- that enjoyed the most mobility to be diverted to Ukraine in order to encircle and annihilate the red army strategic reserves that were based there. That cost days and weeks that allowed Moscow to be fortified. It allowed strategic reserve elements from Siberia to be called upon and transported to reconstitute forces to defend Moscow. And by that time, it was too late to uh, breach the gates of the city uh, because the weather had turned. I mean, this is what happened, okay? Um, It was key decisions, that one being the most uh, damning. But uh, it uh, that's what cost Germany the war. It was it, it, which would cause them victory of the Soviet Union, which would cost them the war altogether. You know, it's uh, it was not uh, it was not underestimation of the enemy. It was not you know that the uh, the German general staff didn't know what it was doing. It was not that Hitler was crazy, and the German general staff basically invented war gaming. Okay, I mean, they gamed the scenario of attacking the Soviet Union for an entire year before, you know, the assault was implemented. You know, the idea that these men weren't drawing upon data or they were flying by the seat of their pants. I mean, it's it's incredibly it's it's incredibly stupid. Um, it's almost as foolish as people claiming I I had a I, I had a guy who actually. Uh, he, he told me with a straight face and this was a guy who like held himself out as a, uh, I don't want to name him because I think people know him. He's like this British guy. And he, he does like YouTube videos about, uh, about the second world war. Um, he actually dropped the canard about, you know, Oh, Germans didn't even, you know, manufacture, you know, winter uniforms. It's like, okay, if you're going to assault the Soviet union in June and you're trying to provide your, you know, you're, you're fitting to provide your army with winter gear. You're preparing to literally lose that campaign. You know, I mean, it's, uh, you don't, you don't, you don't set about in campaigns that, you know, to say like, well, we're, we're going to get bogged down at the gates for objective. Then we're going to hunker down to the winter and then we're going to wait for spring and we're going to try and assault again and see what works that time. Like, it's not, 
<laughs> military operations like succeed or it, or it's it, it's disaster. You know, you don't plan for these like you know losing contingencies. You know, and if you do, as as Lincoln said about McClellan, you know, you're 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 literally like you're literally planning to lose. And I mean, I I uh, I, <laughs> I don't I don't think a general is planning to lose is 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 worth a lot to uh to uh to anybody in uh in warfare. It uh I kind of wanted to uh well, I mean, there's also that the whole myth of that Operation Barbarossa started in the winter. Yeah, you hear people yeah. say that all the time. Yeah. yeah, it's totally well. People, I think people too, and I, I don't want to go too far afield, but it's it's relevant. There's two things that I know, and one of these things is something somebody raised in the comments to me that I wanted to take up. But first and foremost, people, uh, pretty much everybody alive today, like nobody remembers like 20th century general wars. Okay, they remember these like weird managed conflicts that don't have real stakes and that. And I mean, any more these days when the Pentagon goes to war, it's a, it's a make work enterprise. Well, yeah, they're not war for power. Yeah. And they don't realize, they don't realize too, that, you know, if you're an actual like full blown military operation, it, 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 it resolves rapidly. You know, you don't go to war to say like, yeah, we're going to, you know, we're going to muck around in South Vietnam for a decade or, you know, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to occupy Afghanistan for no particular reason because, you know, girls can't go to school there and people grow opium and, we're going to stay there for 20 years and, you know, we're going to get this NGO money and then, you know, we're going to run around and yeah, these guys are the Taliban. We're going to, we're going to tell them to stop doing what they're doing, but it's not a military operation. It's some weird make work like operation short of war that, you know, is on that spectrum, but doesn't really have any strategic objective. I mean, if you're, you know, there's a, uh, the fact that, uh, the fact that, uh, but again, I mean, that's why it shows you how, I mean, I made the point before that, uh, you know, the Second World War was actually a few different conflicts. And, um, you know, the Soviet Union, uh, the Soviet Union fighting the, the Wehrmacht to a stalemate, um, that could have actually resolved a few different ways. You know, had, 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 had uh, kind of the fix not already been in between Mr. Roosevelt and Stalin and say, like, you know, that you had an American regime that even if inclined to go to war with the Third Reich was not really willing to, you know, to uh, to generate this kind of operational independence with the Soviets, you got to very, very easily going to come to the Soviets, you know, saying like, we'll accept a peace as long as you withdraw to white Russia or something, you know, or like, you know, withdraw like within 30 kilometers of, U of the Ukrainian border or the Ukrainian Russian border. And like, you know, we'll, we'll set that as, you know, kind of like the, the, uh, the, the treaty line, but it's by, you know, this was by no means like set in stone. And, um, you know, like I said, the fact that, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, if, if Germany just were, if, if, if the Germans were these fools and these guys who weren't drawing upon any real data and hadn't gamed, you know, possible scenarios adequately, you know, it's like, okay, then why did it take 195 weeks for Moscow to reach Berlin? You know, like they should have, they, there should have been, okay, the German assault failed. Here's the Red Army counterattack. Three months later, you know, there's, you've got, uh, you've got the Red Army like smashing across like the Oder River. You know, I mean, that's, that, so that's important too. I mean, it was political conditions that, uh, and, and, you know, uh, uh, America literally, you know, providing life support, you know, uh, and, 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 uh, in the, in the form of, you know, really whatever, whatever was necessary was ever, whatever was necessary to sustain the campaign that kept them in, in the game. And it, uh, you know, the, um, it's also, it's a testament to, you know, the reason why the Germans were so, it's, I, uh, people who claim to looking at the raw numbers of, uh, of, uh, opposing forces that the Wehrmacht was facing, a lot of the Red Army was incredibly tough, incredibly game. A lot of it wasn't. Okay, simply having piles of weapons, you know, or simply having armored vehicles, you got to train people to fight in a modern war, okay? You've got to integrate your operational elements you know, to actually be cohesive enough that, you know, they can act operationally in the way that they need to, you know, you, you, piles of hardware don't decide wars. That's why it's just totally insane that, you know, okay, America's just going to send $50 billion in military hardware to Ukraine, like to do what, like, what's that going to do? You know I mean? Like it, uh, it, it's not, you, you, you can't just drop weapons on people and suddenly they become like trained, trained, like, you know, tankers or, you know, suddenly they become like competent, like infantry NCOs, you know, you can't even, 
there's a lot of people running around who don't even know how to like fire a gun. Okay, you know, like it. Uh, it uh, and even any even if they're competent with weapons, they're certainly not like comfortable with like some freaking knockoff NATO like AR-15. I mean, why would they be? You know, like if you never if you haven't been habituated to that, I mean, that's uh, it, I mean, it's all these things, but it's uh, the um, the uh, the uh, you know, and it's not just uh, what decided the war was uh was uh was what happened in in august and then you know the the failure of the assault on moscow but you know the germans also they reached leningrad within weeks you know there's this horrible siege it was like medieval in character for years like what happened in leningrad is like horrifying you know and then uh it was months later but you know the germans not only did they reach stalingrad they breached the gates of stalingrad you know the stalingrad defenders were fighting within stalingrad you know like it was not so i mean it's <coughs> they lost the war, but you know, they, they reached, uh, they reached all of their objectives territorially. I mean, I realize that that's not decisive in, in terms of victory metrics, but you know, that, 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 that's, that in of itself to imagine if the calculus was basically correct. I mean, it, uh, it, um, it goes, it should go without saying, but another thing I wanted to raise, like a couple of guys in the comments, and they hear this a lot. Um, they're like, well, you know, the Wehrmacht lost the war because they were just killing everybody and they were doing these racist things and they were like ethnically cleansing people. That did happen, particularly incident to the commissar order and other things. But, you know, my rebuttal of that, man, is that I and I don't want to go too much outside the scope of the Second World War, and particularly the Ost Front. But, you know, I read a lot about Pinkville, which is where Mili 4 was located. And I don't want to get into some really detailed discussion of what the rules of engagement were in Vietnam. And what military law says about um about free fire zones, but Vli four was located in the free fire zone. The people there had refused to evacuate. Um, that was an operational hub of the National Liberation Front, you know, aka the Viet Cong. When America Division arrived there, they arrived there with the intent to annihilate that village, and that's what they did. And this was above board. And Stars and Stripes, you know, the U.S. Army newspaper, they ran a story about it. America Division, you know. Assaulted me like four big victory. Hell yeah. You know, we, we struck a blow against Victor Charlie, you know, it wasn't until it wasn't until, uh, you know, a year and some months later that, you know, kind of the truly gruesome details got released by a couple guys who were there, you know, who began writing the, to a couple anti-war senators about it. Then it was splashed across the evening news. But my point is that this was kind of the face of modern war. You know, like Romanian and, and German infantry going into a, a Belarusian village and, and, and you know, and killing every killing every commissar and every Jewish military age male. That's pretty horrible. But I can give you just as many examples that the French army carried out in Algeria or the U.S. Army did in South Vietnam. I mean, I this is not some like outlandish thing. And frankly, too, you know, uh, people in Kazakhstan, people in Tajikistan, people in Ukraine, people in Belarus, people in Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, they joined the Waffen SS. They joined the Axis cause. You know, the this, people forget this because now uh, the regime is pretending that, you know, the Ukrainians are, you know, George Washington and, and the, the Continental Army or whatever. But for the last 50 years before that, you know, what we heard was that Ukrainians are a bunch of awful brutes and Nazis and they, they collaborated with, you know, the Third Reich. So, I mean, it's depending on how people were treated in theater, it depends on the people you were talking about. It depends on what German formation was operational there. You know, it depends on what year and month you were talking about. I mean, there was not just one way. This is the way that Germans treated civilian populations. You know, they treated, uh, they treated some civilian populations as like they would German people, some populations. Yeah. They, 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 they slaughtered them like animals, but that's, that's not strange. And it's, uh, you know, it does bear repeating, as I've said, and uh, we'll get into this in the Nuremberg episode. But, um, you know, so and this is documented and these, you know, after the Soviet archives were thrown open in 91, you know, the Soviet, like by conservative estimate, the Soviet Union annihilated 10 million people before a shot was fired in the Second World War. I mean, yeah, I'm not going to say like, you know, that that's a good thing that the Wehrmacht and the and uh, the SS SD were were slaughtering people including women and kids but i mean it's kind of it's you know emphasizing you know the instances of, of german brutality and and, and just kind of redacting the rest of it i mean that okay that that seems a bit cynical and 
dishonest, but you know, that's um that's my take on that. And I mean, plus it was I mean it was a total war. I I was reading about I was preparing some of my notes for our our, our, our next episode on the area bombing. You know, within literally fifty thousand people died in Hamburg, you know, all the civilians, um over the course of two days. Like that's insane. Like America was preserved if a couple thousand people die on 9-11. And I'm not, I'm, that, that's terrible. Okay, I'm not saying that that's nothing or something. But, I mean, can you imagine a country like a third the size of America losing 50,000 people in one day? Like just by literally having them like burned to death by incendiaries? That's completely insane. You know, I mean, that's not, there's not any difference between, you know, what the Germans doing on the Eastern Front and what, what the Royal Air Force and U.S. Army Air Corps were doing to people in places like Hamburg and Dresden. There's not. And frankly, in fact, I mean, I'd, I'd rather get shot in the face by the SS than like be burned to death, like in in some basement in Dresden. I mean, frankly, it, you know, if given a choice, which I really, really hope I would never be offered such a choice, but it, um, that's uh, that's all uh, that's all I got for this episode. And um, I didn't mean to get bogged down so much in like minutia of like military science because it's not my wheelhouse, but it's important and. I think for context, it, that's kind of the evidence one must present in order to rebut the popular myths. So I hope that people found it informative and not too kind of, you know, boring and, and bogged down with minutia. No, there was a lot of meat in there. and Yeah, um, I appreciate yeah. that. But yeah. next, well, if it's okay with you, it's your show. And it's not for me to dictate the, <laughs> the programming. But what do you think? The next, next episode... Uh, I'd like to finish up Barbarossa and deal with, you know, the Western Allies war against the Reich. Um, and uh, we'll get into things like Hamburg and Dresden then, um, if that's agreeable. Okay. It sounds good to me. Yeah, it sounds good to me. All right. right. G- give your plugs. Okay. You can find me at uh, realthomas777, one word, dot substack.com. That's where my podcast is. That's where my long form is. About half of it's free. That which is not, it's only five bucks a month. So don't be a hobo. You can afford it. Um, I just joined Mr. Trump's social media, Truth Social. Uh, not because I love Mr. Trump. I, I mean, I don't hate Mr. Trump either, but it, uh, some dear friends of mine are there. I, I'm hoping that might develop into something. It, but if you're there, you can follow me. I'm the real Thomas 777 there. You can find me on Gab uh, at real Thomas 777. And, uh, if you want to contact me directly, reach out on Substack. I'll drop an email on you, and we will talk about things. And uh, thank you again, Pete. I appreciate it. Till the next time.